Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you for coming. Uh, tonight's topic will really be on something that's pretty universal religiously of all religions. The concept in Hebrew is called the Ahavta L'Reach Kamocha. In English, the term of love your neighbor as yourself. And um, as I say, it's universal. And it's really, Rabbi Akiva says that Klau Gadol Torah. This is the fundamental principle in the Torah. In fact, it's interesting that according to the custom of Chabad, of Nusachari, of prayer, that we begin our prayer with the statement that I accept upon myself the positive commandment to love my neighbor as myself. And it's also interesting that um, story told of Hillel. Uh, there were two great rabbis, Hillel and Shammai, um, Shammai was a carpenter and a non-Jew came to him and told him that he wanted to convert on one foot and uh, Shammai was taken back and he was a tough guy and he had a carpenter's stick and he chased him out of his study hall. The same person went to see Hillel. Hillel had a little different approach and when he said the same words to Hillel, Hillel said to him, that the basic idea of Judaism is what's hateful to you. Don't do to someone else. The rest is commentary. Go learn. And the person became a very religious convert. Somehow Hill saw that in him. But the real question becomes, why would Hillel say to this prospective convert, what's hateful for you, don't do to someone else, when the basic concept according to Rabbi Akiva is basically to love your neighbor as yourself. Why didn't he refer that way? So, this is all based on a uh, two verses, two psukim, in the portion of uh, Kedoshim in the book of Leviticus of Ayikra. And I'm going to quote most of it, but I'm not going to explain all, but it says, Do not hate your brother in your heart. You should surely rebuke your neighbor, Lotis love hate, you should not bear a sin because of him. That's the first verse, verse 17. Verse 17 begins with the concept of Losikom, Lositor, do not take vengeance or bear a grudge. That's when they have Macha to the children of your people, and that I'm not going to deal with today. But finishes off with the words, Viahavta, Lareacha, Kamocha, and you should love your friend as yourself. And the Hashem, I am God. That's the basic outline of it. So for some reason, Hillel started with the beginning of these two verses, of not to hate your brother in your heart. And Rabbi Akiva, with the end of to love your neighbor as yourself. And it's very interesting, what's the connection between them? So, the one is, why does it begin with not to hate your brother in your heart? So, so the Torah here is stressing, in your heart. Because I might have thought that only those feelings that bring about action are forbidden. And so say, hating someone in your heart might be okay, as long as you don't deal with it, bring it up. And it's just the opposite. That if you hate someone in your heart, that's considered to be a sin. Because the truth of the matter is that it will color everything that you do with that person. And the Torah uses the term, ach, brother to teach us that even if a person has acted in a way where you can no longer refer to him as your brother, your friend, or your neighbor, but a brother is always a brother no matter what happens. So you just don't hate him in your heart. And, and it's really talking about life in general. In our social existence, there are times that we're forced to be with people that we may not choose to be with. Um, well, actually, I was about to say, even when you're, when you're home, you can choose, but that's not always true. That's why it deals with the word, your brother. There are people in your family that you may not like. You may love them. Sometimes it's even tough with children. Sometimes children have personalities that you find difficult to deal with. It doesn't mean you don't love them, but it's difficult to deal with. So the terminology the Torah uses very precisely of ach, of brother, means that sometimes, many times, really, we're in situations where we have no choice but having to deal with certain people. And sometimes they're difficult. Co-workers, customers, 
congregants. Not everybody is exactly what we would like them to be. And the Torah says, treat them as a brother. And this concept of brotherly love does not come with conditions. A brother is a brother. And therefore, you look, you look aside, you make excuses. And at the same time, the next verse says, you should actually rebuke him. And it's interesting because it's a double term. The Torah doesn't say just rebuke him. It says it twice, which means that you should do it numerous times, but in a friendly way. Uh, and you need to look at the act and not the person. We do that with child rearing. We always tell a child that he's done something wrong, but he's still a good child, so that we don't make him think of himself as evil. And the Torah here is very clear. Our society kind of tells us to mind our own business. And especially we as Jews believe that we all are all part of one body. That body constitutes, brings together what we call the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. You have a crossword puzzle, not a crossword, a jigsaw puzzle. It has a thousand pieces. One's missing. Throw it away. It's useless. Every piece is important. And this is the way a person needs to see another Jew, another person, regardless of. And imagine a person who has a toe that's bothering him. And you ask him, how are you feeling? He says, I'm doing wonderful, but my toe, my toe has problems. And the answer is no. If he has a pain in his toe, his whole body hurts. It's connected to his whole body. It's not divorced from his body. And this becomes important. So when you see someone doing something, you cannot, that's negative, you cannot turn a blind eye to it. On the other hand, there are times you don't jump in. Uh, for one, hocheach tochiach means first rebuke yourself and only then rebuke someone else. Because when you tell someone to do something and you're doing the same thing, of course he's not going to listen. And um, also that <laughs> we, we have a tendency of speaking first and thinking afterwards. That if you're going to say something, you know, it's, in marriage we do this a lot of times. I know you're not going to like this. Well, you can't, once you say that, don't say anything. Because you've already set the person up to not want to hear what you have to say. The person already has a negative, his, his negativity is already out because you've said that. So before you say something, you need to find a way to say it, especially... With, with friends, especially with children, even workers, if you're a boss, if you're going to criticize, you need to compliment. So the hocheyak tochiyak means you need to set the soil, so to speak. A farmer just doesn't plant. He prepares the soil for it. So if you're going to do this mitzvah, this is a good deed. And again, many times people define a mitzvah by something that's difficult, and it can be. Because most people, it's amazing, I mean, even people that are Strong people, good people, elevated people. It's not easy to take criticism. And the worst part of criticism, which is basically constructive, sadly enough comes from enemies, people that don't like you. They'll be honest with you. Sometimes not, but it's something to listen to, to wonder if it's true. Sometimes they just want to hurt you. But many times they'll say something to you that has a ring of truth that your friends will not say because they don't want to get you angry, they don't want to get you upset. They're not really being honest with you, especially if you're a strong personality. I always think also, is marriage. Somehow, you know, we marry A's, marry B's. It just seems like spouses just keep coming. They don't stop and listen to what should be or shouldn't be. They just say what's on their minds. But it's important to hear it. It's important to have someone around that can be honest with you. And even more important for you to listen. The, uh, it's interesting that rebuking and not hating are next to each other. Uh, because rebuke can only be given out of love. Like a father. The more he loves, the more he rebukes. Whereas to a stranger, he may say nothing. Uh, imagine if you saw a drunk lying in the street. And you pass by. He's lying in his filth. You're going to shake your head. What a waste of humanity. 
what if you look and you see that he is the child of a friend of yours? Well, you may stop and try to help him. What if you go by and you realize it's your own child? You're going to pick him up by his neck and drag him home and give him a what for, because he should know better that if he's drinking and whatever, drunk in the street, you're going to be much harder on him because you love him more. So also rebuke that comes from love is more apt to be heard and followed. A rebuke giving out of hate can only fall on deaf ears or even worse, cause a person to even sin more. In fact, you need to be careful. It says in Pirkei Elvis, so when you speak to someone, someone's angry and you say something, you get him even to go further than he would have gone before just because he's angry. But words from the heart go to the heart, and that's important. So Hochayach also teaches us that first and foremost, the rebuke must be given in private, where no one else will be aware of it. No one wants to be embarrassed. In fact, we know that embarrassing someone is tantamount to murder. That when you embarrass someone, murder in Hebrew is called shvichas damin, the spilling of blood, pouring of blood. And when you embarrass someone, what you do is blood rushes to their face because they get red, and then it drains and they get white. So that's really moving blood, tantamount to murder. So embarrassing someone is not the answer. So when you have something to say to someone, if you say it privately, sometimes he'll listen because it's how you present it. But one thing for sure, it's much easier to deal with privately. Uh, you know, as a boss, I, I'll never talk to someone in, in front of anyone else because then they have to show how, how, how who they are. It turns into a whole shouting match. And not only that, a lot of these things are what I call a hot pot. You never grab a hot pot unless it's an emergency. And if by some mistake you pick it up, you let it go. And that becomes critical. If a person doesn't know how to let go of the pot, then all you can do is burn yourself. So again, sometimes waiting becomes the essence of it so that a person can deal with the situation better. And again, because it says, Lo tisel of chait, you should not bear a sin because of it. Because if you're going to embarrass him, it's like murder. Um, and then you may get him to say things to you that he really doesn't mean. When people are angry, their focus is on hurting. Honesty doesn't make a difference. They just want to say things. They want to get to the core. And once you say something, you can't take it back. So a person needs to know that if you're going to rebuke someone, um, that it needs to be done again out of love to make that connection. And... The next verse connects with that and says, again, about not taking vengeance or grudge, but, and it says, that you should love your friend as you love yourself. Ani Hashem, I am God. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, end this week with a story of uh, a king there was uh, two, two individuals that grew up in, as, as, as young friends. And when they got older, they separated. One decided to go to another country that was bordering that country and join the army. Because he felt he could find advancement there quicker than in his own country. And his friend was very sad to see him go and tried to talk him out of it, but he couldn't do it. And his friend said to him, what if war breaks out between our two countries? He said, there hasn't been a war for years. There won't be a war. And sure enough, war broke out. And uh, this person who had moved to this other country was captured, coming back to his country fighting, and was caught as a spy. And um, when he was tried, he was sentenced to, to be hung. And when the king asked him if he had any last words, he said, I know I have an unusual request. He said, what I'd like to do is go home for two weeks, take care of all my affairs. I have three children at home. And if I go back, I can make sure they'll be set for life. And if I don't, they'll be lost. They'll have nothing. And I'll come back, and then you can hang me. And everybody in the court's laughing. And the king kind of looked at him with a smile. It's a ridiculous request. But then the friend who was there stood up and said, Your Highness, I will stand in his place. If he doesn't come back, I'll go in jail for the two weeks. If he doesn't come back, hang me. And the king was kind of amused. And he said, okay. And he let the man go back. And when the day of the hanging came, sure enough, the man hadn't returned to no one's surprise. And the friend was taken to the gallows, walked up the stairs, and the noose was put around his neck. 
And as the executioner was about to pull the rope, there was a cry out from the crowd, here he comes, here he comes, traffic. And uh, he goes running up to the scaffold, and he takes the noose off of his friend's neck and puts it around his own, and hugs him and kisses him and says, thank you. And he tells the executioner, I'm ready. Before the executioner can pull the rope, the friend says, you know what, you have a family, I don't have one. Really, you should go back home. They'll kill me. So he takes the noose and puts it on his neck. And the friend says to him, you're nuts. I'm the one who did what happened. I'm the one who's convicted. So he took the noose and put it on his neck. And the friend says, no, you're crazy. You have a family. You can't do this. He took the noose and put it on his neck. And the king's watching this, and he can't believe it. And it's going back and forth with the noose going from one to the other. And the executioner just has his hands out. He looks at the king. The king said, enough, enough. He says, I'll tell you what. He said, I'm going to pardon you on one condition that I become your friend, because that's the kind of friend that I want to have. And that becomes the key of what God wants with us. God wants to be a partner with two people that love each other. And that's one of the reasons why the word love in Hebrew, we deal with numerical values, the word ahava, love, is numerical value of 13. When two people love each other, the, the highest name of God, the yud kei vav kei, is numerical value of 26. That brings God into the mix when two people love each other. And God willing, next week we'll continue talking about this love affair that a person should have with another person. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos.